Hey everybody, Radaman here uh, with a little tutorial video on how to design a furnace that will be able to regulate its own temperature and pressure. Um, this, as a warning, is a very advanced design, so you need to know a lot about the game and you need a lot of resources to be able to complete such a project. Um, but without a further ado, I'm going to begin. So the first thing that uh, I'm going to do is lay out a steel frame as a point of reference for our project. So that is our steel frame. Now we're going to put a furnace down. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that this furnace has its pipes um, sort of embedded into the frame here. Um, that is a very important aspect of this project. Um, in fact, we can bring it one forward. That wouldn't hurt. Uh, but we need the pipes. Oh, that wasn't even forward. We need the pipes uh, facing the frame. And uh, it will be more apparent why it is important later on. Now, I just need to be able to center this thing. There we go. So now these pipes are facing the back of the frame. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is to grab some piping and lay some somewhat complicated piping out. Uh, it's not that bad, but it's not the most simple. Uh, so what we're going to do is we will uh, first put a corner piece and have this corner piece... Um, Let's see, maybe even a T-junction. And have one of the T-junction face down, one face up like this. Then we're going to grab the T-junction again and rotate it around to form uh, sort of this shape. It doesn't have to be like this. Once you understand what's going on, uh, you can modify this to your own liking. So the next thing we're going to do is to get regulators and get pumps we need two of each we're making five but we need two of each and we were going to have a pressure regulator so the top is output and the bottom is input so we're going to have a back pressure regulator uh for the top like this and a pressure regulator for the bottom like this very straightforward um, so this will allow a pressure regulator, and we'll set this pressure regulation uh, to 2100. That pressure will allow us to make everything but invar. And then we'll set the back pressure regulation to make sure it doesn't get too pressurized to 2150. So it's going to keep it in that sweet zone. Uh, next, we're going to grab our volume pumps. So the bottom, once again, is input. So a volume pump facing inwards and a volume pump facing outwards. Um, that's data ports facing down or inside. So there we have our two volume pumps. And those volume pumps will be able to allow us to make drastic changes to pressure uh, without having to wait for how long it takes the regulators to regulate. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we want to feed um, the gas on the right side back to the left. It's actually arbitrary, but you'll see eventually where this leads to. So I'm setting up corner pieces and then this piping here will um, find its way back to the other side. And then this uh, we will have set up to go down like this. And everything eventually, let's add some more pipes, is going to be interconnected. Um, at the end of this. So another little T-junction and then maybe a corner piece. This is, uh, or actually let's put a T-junction in here as well. And just some straight pieces. All right, so now everything is sort of connected to one another, right? And I can uh, temporarily just uh, snip the frame now that we are no longer using it as a frame of reference no pun intended. And there you go. You have a nice pump there. And um, you might have been able to guess 
let me just discard some of this, that what's going here is a kit tank to hold our excess gases, whatever they might be. So we'll have the kit tank face all this uh, piping plumbing. And that is the first step. And this is enough of a setup for a pressure regulated furnace. That part wasn't all that tricky. Um, I'm sure all you guys Zero G. probably have pressure regulated furnaces already. Um, that's not the uh, sole purpose of this video. But let's, um, let's wire everything up now so that uh, we can set up our regulators and pumps. So let's bring the power in like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to run cables. Maybe down. Seems to not be able to connect so well. So what I'll do is I'll run the cables this furnace seems to be getting in the way so I can move the cables around a little bit um, see on this side we can run them out like this and cables and um, pipes can intersect when they're straight so that works perfect. Just trying to wire this up in a not so nonsense way. So it's easier to see. Uh, very quickly can these projects become a jumble of cables. Um, and you kind of want to limit the jumble as much as you can. Um, because if it becomes a jumble, if you ever have problems or you know, it also costs more resources. There's a lot of reasons not to sort of uh, junk it all up. So now the right side is all powered up. Uh, this left side is going to be a little bit more complicated because of the tank placement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the tank over a little bit just by one unit to free up some space, which means we need to lay one more pipe down. And then we can likewise do the same sort of wiring on the other side, keep it nice and symmetric. Uh, you can set it up however you want, but um, the more sort of nice and neat it is, the easier it will be for you to maintain it and to understand it. Um, so that was my sort of idea here. Um, so what I'll do here is a three-way corner. Oh, these don't even do with three-way corners so easily. Let's see what it did over here. Junctions. So this side will have to be slightly different than the other side, just given the constraints of the piping. Which is fine, as long as it works, right? As long as it works. Alright, so now we have the heavy cables down and power running to our regulators and, and pumps. Um, the regulators and pumps, as you can see, these regulators face uh, inwards. If you want to have them accessible from the front, that's fine too. You'll just need to run cables out the top and bottom. It doesn't make that much difference. So functionally right now, this will work as a pressure regulated furnace, but like I said, we're interested in temperature uh, regulation as well. So what I'm gonna do for right now is to lay down some frames. Uh, and this will allow for some construction and welding and the, and the like. And I think what I need to do is deconstruct this uh, roof here. This will, this window is gonna prevent me from framing up the top half but what will happen right now is 
sort of this zero G float thing. So let me get another frame in above it. And then I can put a frame down and then we'll to put that away. Spawn in some steel sheets. And weld this so I have gravity again. All right, so now that you have this like sort of cage, the idea is to uh, essentially um, not use this back piece here. So we can go ahead and um, snip this because this will be an airlock of sorts and uh, weld in pieces all around the furnace's exit pipes. Just like that. And then we can also um, plop a kit wall here. Uh, it doesn't need to be a window, but for teaching purposes, I'm going to have this be a double paned window like this. So we'll just construct the iron sheets for now. We'll add in the glass later. That's what it looks like so far. Now what's important is any wiring that you place inside of this cube needs to be heavy cabling. Um, and the reason, reason for that is because this room is going to get incredibly hot. Um, I'm talking um, almost melting steel temperatures. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm going to line the room with heaters, just like this, and point the power uh, either upwards or downwards, basically accessibly, so that I can gain access to the power ports. And we're going to line these. And this is why it's really an expensive project. The idea here is this room will have a little bit of atmosphere and a lot of heat. And this room will heat up to such a point that we can keep the, um, the gas in these pipes, which connect directly to the furnace, piping hot. That is, the, uh, that is sort of the design here. Um, so... We need to make sure all of these uh, heaters here have ports that are accessible. Um, and I'll be wiring them up in just a moment. And I'm using more heaters than I really need. I haven't actually calculated literally the amount of heaters that um, are required. It's quite a few, um, but I don't have a literal number for you, so... Um, I would advise you to just put down roughly the same amount that I'm putting down. It should work. All right, so that's all of my heaters. As you can see, it's a very, very um, loaded full of heaters kind of room. I'm going to grab the remainder of our cabling and start um, laying it out so I can power it all. Um, so we can use some six-way junctions in these awkward corners. Let's get some more heavy coil cables. And wiring this up is um, pretty straightforward, although it looks complicated. It really isn't. You're just trying to connect everything to everything it's really just that simple so everything on the bottom now is sort of interconnected uh, what I'll do here is set up a three-way junction with the cable piece pointing outwards like that 
And I can do that here as well. And then these corner pieces here uh, can be just traditional junctions out like that. And then once you have at least one cable into every heater, just as I'm doing, you can then remove the uh, frame pieces. So let me just do a quick sanity check. I believe every single heater now has cables to it. So we can get rid of these frames. As they're uh, no longer needed. And it looks like my angle grinder is out of power. So please forgive me. I'm going to grab uh, grab one of these batteries. Maybe swap my suit battery out as well. So I don't have a low power message anymore. Because I'm on creative, I am in fact using Zero nuclear G. batteries. Which are not at the moment constructible um, normally. All right, so now that we have all of this stuff wired up, uh, let's grab the heavy cabling again and interconnect it all. So let's put a four-way junction here and likewise a four-way junction here. Keep this nice and symmetrical. Put some nice cabling like this and that. And you can paint this or do whatever you like with it design-wise. There are, are other ways to cable this all up and make it not look so ugly. Um, it's just my choice to make it as ugly as it is. Um, but I want to show as much as I can, as I said, um, which means sort of uglifying it for teaching purposes. I have a sort of compacted version in one of the bases that I originally made and I really like the design so I wanted to share it with all of you and eventually this uh, cabling will find its way down so now quick sandy check there is one up top here if I jetpack all the way up so what I'm gonna do is actually put in four-way junctions here just to keep this nice and symmetrical and connected up both sides. So we have corners. This will obviously be a three-way junction. Some straight pieces. And obviously any heater that you forget to wire up won't turn that nice pink glow um, signifying that it is heat. Uh, so it's pretty easy to troubleshoot if you are um, lacking any, in any um, spot, one spot. All right, now some straight cables to get us over here. And then uh, let's go ahead and spawn some more heavy cables in. I'm just gonna put six way junctions cause they're easy and I'm lazy. Obviously you can wire these up so that they're a lot cleaner. That'll do. And now every single one of these heaters should be able to turn on, as you can see. And the next step is to grab some more piping, which let's see if I have any discarded around here, just sort of strewn about. Uh, I do. And uh, the idea here is to lay out um, sort of as much pipe as you can for radiators. Um, so I'm not going to do a phenomenal job here. Um, it's going to be good enough. Um, but uh, you can probably figure out a way to lay out as much. So a radiator requires a straight um, section of pipe. Um, and obviously what I'm doing right now isn't going to have a lot of straight sections of pipe. But you want as many straight sections of pipe inside of this uh, reverse heat sink as possible. Um, and it doesn't really matter if the input and output 
connects, the top pipes and the bottom pipes connect uh, because they all act as if they're a part of the furnace, essentially. Um, so what we could do here is we could throw in a T-junction and another T-junction and sort of connect them like this. And obviously, this doesn't have a lot of space for um, uh, radiators, but um, which is important to have some space for radiators. But obviously, it didn't take the time to do the best job possible. So I really only have uh, space for four radiators here, which is pretty paltry. But it will do. So we'll have the radiators sort of point to one another. And actually, if I just replace these with um, traditional straight pipe, um, we can actually re regain some input output. Um, we can regain some space for additional radiators. So you have this sort of weird reverse heat sink thing going on here. Um, then what we can do is grab the remainder of our walls and wall all of this in. And I'm going to use windows just so that we can see what's going on. Right, there we go. Uh, then I need some iron sheets. And windows obviously have the uh, some of the lowest pressure sensitivities. Um, that's fine. You just have to be a little bit more careful. There's different ways of doing this. I'm not doing it the extraordinarily careful way. So now that everything is glassed up, uh, this last part, we're going to have uh, just your traditional sort of airlock. Um, so let's go ahead and, and that's why this back piece was sort of incomplete, unfinished. We're going to have a little airlock and that keeps the pressure that's inside of your furnace. Um, it keeps it, uh, you know, in there. Um, so um, you can have one airlock or two. Uh, I'm going to have two, so we definitely keep needs to be in this compartment in this compartment so what i'm going to do is i'm going to change this design a little bit just a tad to remove one of these wall heaters um oops i threw the wrong thing looks like i'm almost out of batteries here so i'm going to swap that out now Zero G. so please excuse me for just a second um so swapping out one of those wall heaters um, so that we can instead uh, Zero G. put a, a passive vent as part of the uh, venting. So let's get a passive vent and an active vent, just part of an airlock. Whoa, I hit the wrong button. So my passive vents are God knows where. Um, and I think it might actually be easier to put this on the ceiling. So we'll just uh, go ahead and plop a steel frame back there and um, sabotage our ceiling here a bit so we can put another one. So now I need some steel sheets and welding torch. We'll just weld this up here briefly because once I crowbar this window We'll lose our gravity, or we would have lost our gravity had I not welded that there. Um, as you can see, uh, clutter is quite an issue. Anyone that has done sort of a, a revamping of a base, uh, you know that clutter occurs like contagiously. All right, so now we're able to put uh, the vents down. Let's go ahead and do that. 
So event will go here instead. Our pass event. And then let's get rid of those. Our act event will go inside the airlock. All right, so we need sensors in our airlock as well. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys probably know how sensors work. And then console, a kit console. And it would help if I had some walls on this thing. So let's get some walls. And we're getting pretty close to completion. Uh, we need to pressurize things, but pretty close. All right, so now that we have the kit walls, we can put this console down, which will allow us to activate the airlock. And for right now, our airlock will have to be manually opened. Plop a airlock circuit board in there. Oh yeah. Um, we need a little bit more pipe. Let's see if I, no, I did not put it in my uniform. It is under this frame. All right, so we'll have a kit pipe run between our two vents. That's wonderful. All right, and now we can plop this other airlock in and probably for now just crowbar it open. Um, so the airlock control needs a little bit of glass as they all always do. Um, have some glass sheets right here, so let's finish that off. And uh, anything all the way out here doesn't need heavy cabling, but just going with the theme of the day, uh, I'm going to keep the cabling going. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wire everything up to this console and let's get the vents and sensor powered up as well. This part's pretty straightforward. I think uh, anyone making this sort of project uh, should already be familiar with uh, basic uh, uh, basic airlocks. And this airlock is really functionally not that much different other than the fact that it will get extremely hot. So just laying in the rest of the cabling here. And now everything is wired up to one another. And I need to wire it up to the rest of the grid. Which means just sending a, a cable over here and hooking it up to this uh, extraordinarily, oh, I guess we're a little bit too close to the airlock. So a little bit further. And then hooking it up to this extraordinarily ugly six-way connector thing, uh, which you can, in your design, avoid. Um, I'm not going to go out of my way to do just that. All right, so at this point, uh, we have most of what we need. Um, let's just go ahead and trim up, clean sort of what we don't need uh, so what we don't need here is, oh, those are probably gone for good. We don't need these frames up top anymore. And instead, we can start to put uh, walls down. 
and this is an airlock uh, you can have windows it really doesn't matter how you build your airlocks it's just an airlock it's just a pretty standard airlock there we go Our beautiful little airlock with a working vent that's one of the things that matters. Um, so you need to make sure that your little furnace thing is airtight, uh, which I know ours is not at the moment. We have to build this window in. And now we can just kind of do an air tightness uh, sanity check here. Um, closing this door, hitting F5 for me because uh, I'm in creative and we can fill this with pressure and it holds until I open the airlock. So that's perfect. That's all nice and pressurized. Um, and what I'm going to do next is... Whoa. I'd like to keep my ink grinder. Uh, what I'm going to do next is um, either start feeding the furnace or setting up power consoles. So what I'm going to do is setting up uh, really ugly power consoles at first uh, just to make sure they uh, this functions so we're gonna have one power console for all the heaters and another for the regulators um, and I think that's probably gonna be enough so we're gonna have these two lovely consoles And of course, when you're building this for real, uh, you don't have to put them in such an ugly spot. And let's go get a data disk. And this outside one here is going to be for all the heaters. So it's going to be a linked power console to all those heaters. So let's just search heat. And all of these heaters I'm going to need to select. And from one hit of this button, every single heater inside of our little uh, gas heating chamber will flick on um, together in unison. And that, uh, of course, can be eventually linked up to logic circuits to temperature control a little bit better. But uh, honestly, we're just looking for it to get over 1200 um, degrees. And if we power that on, all those heaters go on. And then this next one is going to be for the regulators, which I could do manually, but they face inwards. It's pressure and back pressure regulator. We'll power those on. And the last is to um, set up your airlock. So the exterior door is that one. The interior door, active vent. Gas sensor. Let's finish the airlock. All right, that's perfect. Cycle to interior. Cancel pressurization. So I can pressure test it. Cycle to exterior. And I'm going to cancel the depressurization so we lose some. I want it to vent out because what will happen is we don't want too much pressure in the inner chamber. While it heats up, it's going to uh, pressurize even further because hot gases uh, will expand. So if we cancel this pressure, we have a pressure of about 100. And what's happening... Right now is the batteries in my tool belt are on fire. Uh, this will happen to you. So if I uh, if I go ahead and drop my tools or go into a vacuum, it will uh, self-regulate. And that is uh, one of the common problems of this. So what's going on right now is not exactly sure what's burning in there. Um, but uh, let's go and spawn some item oxide.
and some item volatiles. And yes, this is a lot. And we're going to pump the excess pressure out. Sometimes the game likes to set things on fire that should not be on fire. So let's go ahead and just reload this real quick. There is a current bug with steel frames. Steel frames like to um, be on fire for no, uh, no real apparent reason. All right, we're going to get a Atmos analyzer and a cartridge here. And if we look, this small tank is slowly pressurizing. Not so slow, actually. And once this gets within uh, about 2K, I can switch off the uh, pump. And now it should self-regulate once the uh, regulators are on, which it's a little tricky to check whether they are. I have to find spot but yeah it looks like they're on and it looks like uh, this walling that I did kind of burned and blew out uh, so let me let me replace that um, with composite walls that are far less likely to have issues I guess we'll be able to see in through the front, which is fine. All right, so we'll just plop some composite walls. And, and the composite walls, uh, I mean, I like a gas uh, furnace chamber room just because you can see into it. Uh, but the composite walls function um, for pressure a little bit better. All right, so that, there we have it. Um, now, let's see what kind of pressure we have. Yes, so we have more pressure available to us. I'm just going to quickly flood some in. And as you can see, it just combusted. And it is currently combusting a little bit more. So let's siphon some of it out. And what will happen, um, or what should happen, is the gas that's in the furnace will freely cycle around this sort of heat exchanger. And as soon as I pressurize the heat exchanger with atmosphere, which I am about to do, I'll use my propellant so I don't add too much gas to this room. This room is, that room inside there is going to slowly heat up. And if you want, you can put sensors uh, for the room. Uh, but. The way it works is this room will slowly heat up with the gas inside of it, which will then heat up uh, the gas in the pipes. So as you can see, we're kind of getting this atmospheric warping. Um, and the temperature of this uh, chamber here is going to be increasing. Um, so let's go ahead and flood some more of our gases in. And given enough time, uh, as long as you are uh, watching the pressure and the temperature of your furnace chamber, uh, this furnace chamber's temperature will slowly climb to the point where I'll be able to smelt just about anything I want, and um, it will hold temperature. If it ever gets too hot, you can obviously turn your heaters off. If it gets too cold, you can turn it back on. Um, so as you can see, the temperature is going to continue to rise, uh, because what's happening is... All the gas in these pipes are getting superheated by this chamber, um, and as long as the chamber has nothing flammable and is not, you know, torching itself or getting hyper-pressurized, that's another problem. Is sometimes the heat will pressurize the, the gas in that chamber so much that the uh, the chamber will blow out. So using steel frames or iron frames can avoid that, as there's no pressure limit, and also blast doors. Uh, right now I'm using airlock doors, but blast doors would have no pressure limit. But as you can see. The temperature is still climbing, and it's going to slowly climb um, up and up and up until the point where I can smelt just about anything. So, um, you know, if I have 
uh, gold ore, for instance, uh, which normally the arc furnace takes a very long time to make. I can make gold ore uh, just about instantly, as you can see. And there's gold ingots popping out. And the pressure is self-regulating, and the temperature is self-regulating as well. Or really, it's not self-regulating, but at least it keeps it hot enough to be able to smelt um, just about anything I want. So, for instance, um, one more little stress test, I guess, because we want to um, test compounds, too. Uh, so, let's see. What compound can we make? We can make, uh, at a 1200K temperature, we can even make Invar. But at 1000K, we can make Constantin, which is um, copper and nickel. Um, so, we're not quite at 1000 yet. At this temperature, at 800, uh, let's see what we can make. We could make, we could smelt nickel, we could make electrum. I guess I'll make electrum. So let's make 100 grams of electrum. Uh, we'll do silver. So I take my 50 silver, close the mold, my 50 gold once it's done smelting. And out pops really easy electrum. And um, given enough time, if you smelt way too much at once, the temperature will drop, but then it will start self-regulating again uh, in this wonderful uh, one-stop shop furnace. So I hope this little video uh, was detailed enough. If you have any questions about this furnace, just let me know. Um, there's a bunch of little designs, but basically the idea is you use heaters, radiators, and pipes for the temperature and pressure regulators for the pressure, and you should end up with a pretty handy little self-regulating furnace just like this. So I hope this helped. Um, drop me a line if it did, um, and if you have any questions, like I said, or feedback or concerns or, or suggestions, just uh, let me know, and I will catch you all next time. Adios, guys.